<laughs> Tell me a little bit about Texar and what you guys do. Sure. Texar is a volunteer nonprofit search and rescue team um, that practices several disciplines all related to the search and rescue arena. There we go again. So tell me, how does it work when you go through cases like, I know you can't speak on it, but missing persons, like something that we're dealing with right now? Sure, absolutely. That's one of the areas that we do assist law enforcement with. Um, the way Texar is set up, we do not deploy unless a agency requests us. We don't deploy at the request of family members. Um, we always direct them to their local agency. But once a agency requests Texar, um, we have several resources that we can bring to bear to assist law enforcement. Um, we have canine teams. We have ground and wilderness uh, search and rescue teams. We do have um, water search and rescue teams as well. So it really kind of depends on the case itself, what the specifics are. Um, we use uh, the science of lost person behavior, which there's been data collected on what lost people do. Um, and depending on what their situation is, what the environment that they're in, what their mental status is, um, and, and several other criteria that help us to narrow down where to focus our search efforts. When you go to a search site, you know, something when they're in like these criminal investigations, when they go to a search site, what does that look like for you guys um, from start setting up to the very end? Right. Usually when we arrive on scene, we initially meet with law enforcement, whoever our point of contact is with the agency that we're working with, um, make sure that we are updated on any um, uh, information that they may have, make sure that we have a clear understanding of where the person was last seen, because that is usually where we will start our, um, our search from, um, and then we make sure that we have any specifics related to the, the individual that's missing. We try and get all that criteria. If we can get it ahead of time, that's fine. If it's a, a imminent search where, you know, a young child's missing and we've just been called out, a lot of times we may not have that information until we get on scene. So it's really just kind of depends on what the situation is um, surrounding the missing individual. But typically we'll make contact with our agency contact um, and then we will come up with a plan of dividing our members into teams and what the uh, search criteria that they're going to use will be. And tell me a little bit about your technology that goes into use when you're in these situations. Sure. Um, we've got quite a bit of technology that we can bring to bear on these searches as well. Um, we have our own um, in, uh, IT department with a director who has developed our own uh, internal program. Um, that we use for everything from tracking our members, uh, keeping you know, managing our membership to managing the missions when we're in the field. Um, we also have a GIS team that we can call upon to help us in developing maps. Uh, we always use um, GPS systems when we're in the field to be able to document the exact areas where we have searched and to incorporate that into the mapping that we use. Uh, we also do take advantage of drones um, occasionally. And we do have our own uh, drone team. And we also have some software that our uh, IT department developed uh, that we was, was just recently released called AIDIT, um, which goes in and analyzes the imaging from drones. And you can specifically request uh, the criteria that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a specific object, if you have an image of that object that it can compare to, it'll search for that. You can specify colors. So if you know the person was wearing a specific color of clothing, um, the program goes in and analyzes the footage pixel by pixel in a matter of seconds and selects anything that matches the criteria that you've selected and draws a circle around it to draw your attention to it. Uh, that all used to have to be done manually by people just going in and reviewing images and looking for things. And it's a very tedious task. And this new software um, that we've developed can reduce that down to a matter of minutes instead of hours and hours of, of searching now. So that, that is quite useful. 
Um, the drones also can, you know, as, as you're sure um, you're familiar with, um, imaging on satellite imaging, like for Google Maps, is, is often years outdated um, and sometimes doesn't really give you a good picture of what the terrain actually looks like now. So we can use our drones to get a, a real-time imaging of what the area that we're getting ready to send our teams into can be. Um, that, those technology that technology really helps us in the field. Um, and it is supplemental to our ground teams that is really the bread and butter of search and rescue. You know, that's never gonna go away is having boots on the ground, having the canines on the ground, but it definitely helps us narrow areas down and helps us focus our search efforts. Pretty amazing technology. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the volunteers? Do they have to go through uh, their training? Can you tell me about their training? Absolutely. Um, that's one thing that we pride ourselves on. We call ourselves unpaid professionals. Um, so all of our volunteers, um, before they are eligible to deploy into the field, have to go through a fairly significant amount of training just before they're even eligible to get into the field. It's about 40 hours worth of training that they have to go through. Um, we we practice, uh, train everybody on the uh, incident command system, which is what law enforcement uses. That's how they expect us to operate. So everybody gets trained on how that works. Um, on the national incident management system, we all do training on that. We have our uh, internal um, wilderness search and rescue training that everybody has to go through that teaches everybody the basics. We do some basic navigation training. All of that has to be done at a basic level before people can even deploy into the field. And then we have advanced skills from that level. Um, and the, the newer people are always paired up with some of the more experienced members. Um, so when we are in the field, we really operate as a team and we have experienced people there that, that know how to best progress through a search. Absolutely, because these searches, they could be pretty tough. Is that Rockstar? They can be. Um, they can be long. Um, you know, as you know, Texas heat uh, can be really tough on the members. It's tough on our canines as well. Um, so it, it can be a very arduous task. What about cadavers? So we do have, um, we call them HRD canines, uh, human remains detection that are trained specifically for searching for human remains um, or cadavers. Um, and they train on a very intense basis. And that is specifically what those canines are trained to do is to find um, human remains. And some of them can detect as small as uh, one gram of uh, remains in a sample. That's pretty, that's pretty intense. That's a it is. great. It is. And we also, we also have, have canines. I'm sorry. It was a great source to have. It is a great source to have. We also have canines that are certified for doing water searches as well. So they can, they'll ride on the bow of the boat and they can smell human remains in the water as well. Wow. No, now, Jeff, my next question was, um, we did have three missing children from yesterday in Amber, Amber Alert. How does it work when you have children and then you have adults? Is it a different protocol, different tasks that you do? It's, um, there's always a little more um, sense of urgency when it's a child, just because of the nature of it. Um, but the process is, that we follow is very similar. Um, it takes into account the criteria um, of how the, the child became missing, um, what environment they are in. Um, you know, a lot of times when an AMBER alert is issued, that means that there is suspect that the child's been apprehended by somebody, they've been abducted. Um, and often in those cases, we would not get involved unless law enforcement believes that the child was released somewhere and is now just out there and that we were searching for a child that truly is just wandering around. Um, we often get cases where a, a child just wandered off and is missing in a, a wooded area or a park or, or something like that. In those cases, you know, they're very similar to um, if an adult is missing. It's just the different criteria that we use for the search. Now, Jeff, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this or not, but when you're searching a landfill, how does that work for you guys? Um, landfills can be very difficult. Um, there's, uh, they're difficult for the, the dogs. They're difficult for the members to search. Um, 
I believe Texar has been involved in a few of those searches in the past. Um, there's there are methods that can help make it easier, but it, it, it's an extremely difficult task, as you can imagine. There's a lot of safety issues with it, um, just because of the environment that you're operating in. Um, and you know, there there are methods that can be used to mitigate some of that, but it is it is a long process. So like in that circumstance, you have to grab and then pull to another section to kind of sort through it. Is that how it works? Right. Um, you know, and I can't speak to any specifics because I'm I'm not I'm not aware of what's happening currently. Um, but the uh typically some one of the methods that's used is to load an amount into a, a dump truck and and spread it in an area away from the main pile and then go through that, search that, and then go to the next section. That's that's one of the methods that's used occasionally. Of many, correct? Correct. Jeff, is there anything else I'm leaving out that you want to add into our story for tonight? I'm not, I can think of. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, appreciate you reaching out to Texar. You know, I, I will say as far as Texar goes, um, you know, I did mention that we're a volunteer nonprofit. We never charge for our services. Um, we don't charge the state. We don't charge the agency. We don't charge the families. We we all do this because it's something that we're very passionate about and believe in. Um, Texas are celebrating its 20th year this year. So we've been around for a while. We kind of know the ropes um, and we're always willing and ready to serve. That's so amazing to hear. That's awesome. Great. Thank you, Jeff, so much. I appreciate your time today. Taylor, I appreciate it very much. Yes, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you so much.